distinct pleasure and honor to welcome Professor Max Liu as the Waterloo Institute for Nanotechnology and Chemical Engineering joint distinguished lecture, lecturer. Professor Max Liu has been the President and Vice Chancellor of the University of Surrey since April 2016. Previously, he was the Provost and Senior Vice President at the University of Queensland, Australia. He has been appointed to the Prime Minister Council of, for Science and Technology, the Boards of UK Research and Innovation, uh, National Physical Laboratory Universities, UK, and serve on the Leadership Council of National Centre for Universities and Business. Uh, he has been uh, at a number of uh, different universities, uh, like for example, he was at NGU in Singapore from 1991 to 1994, as well as in Australia, where he founded the Australia Research Council Centre for ex of Excellence for Functional Nanomaterials and served as his, as his inaugural director for eight years. Uh, he has, of course, a very distinguished academic career over publication over more than 500 journal papers, highly cited individual with a number of awards, including recently being honored the as with the Medal of the Order of Australia as well. So what is distinguished service to education and international research in the field of materials chemistry and nanotechnology. We are really grateful that he is here with us and uh, uh, it's a really pleasure to have Max with you, for, to have you here and uh, we are really looking forward to your talk and thanks for making your time out of your busy schedule to be with us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Yasu Shanda, for your very kind introduction. And uh, uh, it's a great pleasure and honor for me to be here at the Waterloo Institute of Nanotechnology. And thank you, uh, Yasu Shanda, and Michael Tan for the opportunity, for the invitation to be here. Um, I'm going to uh, start by a bit of a commercial uh, telling you a little bit about the University of Surrey that I, I lead as a vice chancellor. So this slide, the cover slide, has uh, some logos here, some symbols, and you probably recognize some, and that's the story of the University of Surrey. Surrey is renowned for its uh, small satellite technology, and that was invented uh, by uh, Martin Sweeting in the 80s as a world leading, and 5G telecommunications world leading, and uh, the mini, Cooper, designed by our professor, and also the 5G aut autonomous vehicle was tested successfully last year. We have four Oscar winners and four Queen's anniversary prize. I'll tell you a little bit about the Surrey today. It's a medium-sized institution uh, in the UK. It's highly ranked, and it's mid-ranked in the top 500 in the world, 240, 250. It has a unique uh, contribution to the national economy about 1.7 billion pounds uh, to the uh, lo uh, local economy, and uh, it has many other contributions to uh, the partnership with industry, and a lot of, uh, this, uh, a lot of uh, collaborations between businesses and industries with our researchers, not the least through about 116 companies on our own research park at the University of Surrey campus. Um, the latest uh, Queen's Anniversary Prize uh, was awarded last year in the field of food and nutrition science. And I was fortunate to, uh, uh, to go to the palace uh, to receive this award with the head of the department, uh, Sue Lanham New. And this is something that uh, the British higher education institutions every two years have this kind of uh, uh, awards, and it's very prestigious awards and with the this is the fourth one for the University of Surrey. Um, the university has a long history of uh, working with the industry, as I said, and the innovation happened, uh, had actually made a lot of uh, uh, you know, significant impact to society from the first generation quantum strain layer laser by Arthur Adams that's used in billions and billions of devices and DVDs to uh, the latest, uh, which is the uh, uh, debris removal satellite uh, was successfully launched this year and then the first mission was completed and to clean up the space junk uh, in the space 
and to the uh, machine learning algorithm to translate sign language into English. And that's a small innovation by our AI expert. And 5G is a, a biggest platform. Uh, by the way, this is the last commercial uh, of my, my talk. I'm going to get into uh, the main topic of today's nanomaterials. The 5G innovation platform uh, has uh, now received uh, 100 million pounds, more than 100 million pounds already with uh, major uh, industrial companies, uh, telecommunication companies as partners, and some of the lists here. And it's an open innovation platform, and it's something I'll return to in my talk, because nowadays, you know, when you want to make a, a quick uh, and, and, and higher impact in terms of developing technology translated into the market, you need to collaborate and partner with uh, many companies and many uh, players. Right, that is in a way is driving this, what I call uh, the virtual uh, cycle for uh, research excellence and for uh, higher education. So the mission of a university is to educate the next generation uh, and, and to really make a contribution to society through your graduates, but secondly, through the innovation. The research excellence and the innovation excellence will drive the economic, social, environmental impact and uh, the direct uh, uh, you know, knowledge contribution uh, through our scholarly activities also contribute uh, to the society in terms of knowledge economy. But all of this will feed back in terms of the reputation. When you uh, do well and do better in all these areas, the, the mission areas of the universities, then you will feed back this loop basically through the reputation of capital. And I emphasize, apart from the usual resources, human resources, and this community or collaboration partnership is another theme I want to talk about. And uh, in the university sector and research communities, collaboration is a key. And therefore, I think Brexit is really bad things happening back in the UK. We're very worried about it. But uh, nothing uh, could stop us from developing more uh, collaboration. And in research, that's true, and also in innovation, so even more so. Now, let's turn to the topic, uh, nanomaterials. What is nanomaterials? And you are all familiar with the definition of nanoscience. I mean, to give you some context, on the left, all these uh, uh, scales and you can relate to, uh, basically speaks to the uh, scale of objects and down to molecules and DNA, for example, and nano uh, dimensional entities or, or objects. So the principle of physics, and according to uh, Richard Feynman, uh, even in 1959, he sort of said this philosophy about nanotechnology is to uh, be able to uh, manipulate atoms or, or molecules to design the materials for specific properties. And that's what uh, started the nanotechnology philosophy. Basically, we're talking about this scale. is the nanoscale uh, between a few hundred nano, uh, atoms to uh, 10,000 nanometers, uh, atoms, that's the nanoscale where properties would change with dimension. Now, whether it's a nanoparticle or nanofibers or nano, nanotubes, when you have a thermal, optical, and, and other physical and chemical properties varies with the, uh, the size of the building blocks, that's where you have added uh, potential and opportunity to create nanomaterials. And in fact, and the whole uh, field of nanomaterials is underpinned by the science in the mesoscale or in the nanoscale. That's basically around you know, 100 to 10,000 atoms. Now, uh, let me just talk about uh, the nanobiotechnology, and then I'll move to the second topic, which is uh, energy nanomaterials. So this, this uh, roadmap is, is very still Laura's work uh, published many years ago is still valid and still quite interesting to look at. If you look at how nanotechnology in terms of the application in uh, biology, in medicine, uh, is, is actually traveling in terms of the application on the 
horizon, uh, the, 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 the x axis, and then the uh, technical complexity as the vertical. Uh, as you can see, the uh, sort of approximately, I mean, it's never accurate when you predict uh, the future of uh, technology. So the materials and components is basically uh, is about, you know, the period uh, from the early 90s to, uh, you know, 2010, around that time. And then now there's more complex. So the next uh, decade or so, you see uh, programmable, programmable uh, hierarchical materials that's going to, uh, into bioelectronics and nanofluidics, and uh, also uh, the applications are going to become more uh, in, 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 in vivo. And eventually, what uh, the nanobiotechnology would lead is the kind of uh, in situ uh, synthesis and self assembly of biomolecules into smart structures uh, and smart uh, structures that has functions for uh, either sensing or diagnostics and treatment or combination of these, the therapeutic uh, devices. Right, um, we have been working uh, in the last uh, uh, decade or so on a particular class of inorganic nanoparticles. It's called the layered double hydroxide. And what essentially this compound is, is really very flexible, very easy to make, and it's low toxicity, nanotoxicity, and low uh, uh, cytotoxicity, uh, ionic exchanger, uh, clay particle that disperse in aqueous solution, it become nanoparticles. And it's a perfect uh, vehicle for drug molecules, sRNA and RNA, and short uh, strand uh, uh, sRNA delivery vehicle. So we've done quite a bit of a characterization. What our contribution here is to synthesize the stable dispersible LDH nanoparticles. And you can see the, uh, uh, the plates is around about uh, 80 to 200 nanometers in lateral dimension. The thickness is typically is one to two nanometers and it's transparent. In aqueous solution, it's stable for three to six months. And this is crucial. You know, you have to, uh, you, know, you can synthesize all these clay nanoparticles, but once uh, you, you, you leave it for a day, normally the, the way you synthesize is by hydrolysis, you know, or, or just the uh, normal uh, bucket chemistry reactions. That won't give you stable dispersible nanoparticle, but a hydrothermal synthesis that we developed a proprietary and patented technology and gives this kind of a dispersion. And uh, you can tune, uh, you can uh, adjust the particle size, the lateral particle size uh, from anywhere from 20 nanometers to 80 nanometers. And the Z potential and the thickness you can also design uh, depending on the needs. Um, we use this as a drug uh, carrier. You can see that you know, when you load a uh, drug, this is a uh, low molecular weight uh, heparin, which is a uh, cardiovascular uh, drug. You load it into the interlayer uh, because this is the, uh, um, the, cation, uh, the anion exchange, so you can see the expansion of the intergully spacing. The XRD can give you uh, the uh, quantification, but you can also quantify by high resolution TEM and give you quite good correlation in terms of the loading amount and the, uh, the despacing uh, uh, enhancement or enlargement. Um, this has been tested to, uh, in, in uh, vitro to release drug in a controlled fashion. And the biphasal sort of a profile is a fast release and then the slow release that you can tune this, basically the kinetics of uh, the uh, molecular um, adsorption and then release. So to really control the target and control the release. And that's just uh, uh, part of the work that uh, did by my PhD student, Sophia Gu. Um, then lately, uh, the last four years, this idea, this kind of uh, nanoclay was applied 
for a different application because there's a, a great need in crop protection. Because every year, uh, across the world, agriculture will lose 20% uh, up to 40%, you know, on average 20 to 30% of the production due to pests and pathogens. And this is a huge problem in agriculture. Now, given that food security as a population growing, we need uh, to uh, really tackle this big problem. Our collaborators uh, in Queensland, uh, in the uh, Queensland uh, Agriculture and Food Innovation Institute, uh, asked us to think about how you can uh, develop a carrier vehicle to deliver sRNA RNA, to really uh, silence the genes of the viruses. And this is something that uh, evolved into this project. Because currently, there's no way to directly protect uh, crops uh, from viruses. Instead, pesticides are applied. And we know pesticide is effective, but it causes environmental issues. Uh, and not only the virus is causing food losses, but the chemicals is, is, is a, a really is an issue in, in terms of the runoffs and the pollution. So new approaches need, is needed. So RNA, the silence uh, RNA, uh, as gene silencing for virus control, has been trialed, has been uh, tested. Um, normally, the plants' own RNA molecule are single-stranded. So in contrast, when the virus reproduces uh, in the, in the uh, plant cell, they go through a stage, uh, what they call, they produce the double-stranded uh, RNA. And uh, this dsRNA, so plants have learned you know, naturally like, as our own immune system to defend, to produce this when the uh, virus attack. Uh, so a natural defense mechanism is the gene silencing. So what we need to do is to apply uh, silencing RNA on the plant so that you know, this becomes a virtual uh, so vaccine for plants. So one can trigger this by applying that. But the problem is that uh, uh, when you try to use uh, RNA for crop pr protection, so normally you have to modify the DNA of the plant cell. And this constitutes the GM crop. So therefore, there's a lot of uh, concerns and the regulatory difficulties with this kind of uh, application. And therefore, what you need to do is to develop, can you develop this spray uh, on the surface? It's called a topical application on leaves, on roots, so that you can actually uh, protect the, uh, the plant by silence, silencing the, the DNA of the virus, but not alter the DNA of the plant cell. And this has been trialed, it's effective. The problem is it's not stable. Naked, uh, sRNA is a double-stranded RNA, it's not stable, it only lasts for 24 hours, and then either get washed away or UV degraded. Therefore, this, this issue, or this is the issue, so right? this, this kind of issues um, provide perfect opportunity for the LDH nanoparticle, we call uh, bioclay when you load the dsRNA uh, together into the inter, gully of the uh, particle. So they actually degrade naturally, and uh, the adhesion between the nanoparticle and the surface of the, the leaves are to uh, typically very strong. It can withstand rain washing. So the simulated rain washing, it can last for 30 days uh, without uh, really being washed away, and it slowly release the dsRNA and to protect the, uh, the, the plant and acting as a vaccine. And this, uh, of course, you know, the mechanism is, is quite uh, simple. That's the uh, mechanism of, of protection. is similar to uh, our uh, human bodies. You know, when you have a vaccine and you produce the, uh, the, the silencing uh, sort of uh, sRNA here and the whole pathway is very simple. It's been proven in uh, a plant biology. So the test is to see how you know, this can be effective in terms of uh, you know, loaded uh, the bioclay, which is the, uh, 
dsRNA loaded into LDH nanoparticles. Um, so the dsRNA of varying sizes, uh, a particular for a particular virus, uh, I can't uh, I remember this is, is I think this uh, is a tobacco uh, plant uh, virus. You know, of course, for different viruses you use different uh, dsRNA, and this particular one is for tobacco uh, plants. So you can actually load this. Uh, you can see uh, from from this. Uh, uh, characterization is loaded in there, and uh, you, you can also uh, you can also see the, the stability. So the LDH uh, nanoparticle actually protects the uh, double-stranded RNA quite significantly, up to 30 days. Whereas the uh, naked ones, at five days, is, is reduced by half, and uh, 10 days is almost gone. So that that's how the uh, uh, carrier nanoparticle can protect the stability. And it does transfect into the surf, from the surface into the cells and some actually into the veins of, of the leaves. And that's uh, you, uh, by a confocal microscope you can see uh, quite uh, clearly. And uh, the bioclay is persist uh, because of the adhesion skirt the protection, it, it protects the double-stranded uh, RNA. And in fact, it bounds there, and uh, uh, you can see the, uh, the washing also uh, does not really uh, remove the uh, bioclay. And in terms of uh, you know, the uh, actual effect in protecting the plant from the virus, you challenge it day one and five and 10 days and 20 days. You can see the uh, before and after. So the uh, effect is quite uh, extraordinary. Uh, this pr protects, you know, there's, a quanti there's a quantification here. I mean, uh, the uh, LDH uh, loaded sRNA is uh, uh, about 10 times more effective in terms of the uh, protection than the naked uh, at DSRNA. Right, uh, I mean, that's a collaboration between uh, uh, my group and also the uh, uh, Nina's group in terms of um, the uh, plant physiology and the uh, uh, DSRNA synthesis is from a Nina's group and then the nanoparticle and the loading characterization and application. And was founded first by the Bill Gates, uh, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, and then later uh, there was a big uh, uh, agriculture company called New Farm in Australia. They actually founded the large-scale trial. At the moment, the paper was delayed for two and a half years because this this uh, commercial arrangement and the uh, large-scale trial is is being held in Victoria, uh, state of Victoria, in many crops. Uh, I think there's some uh, crops here. Uh, I mean, you can uh, apply on tomatoes and uh, tobaccos and uh, different different plants. Uh, even effective for fungus. Of course, for fungus, you have to use a different type of uh, uh, double-stranded RNA. Let me switch gear, um, conscious of time. So we also concerned with energy, uh, climate change. It's, it's a big issue, energy supply, energy security, of course, is very important. Energy itself, we all know, a lot of people in this audience will be familiar, uh, is, is the biggest business in the world. So in terms of infrastructure, it's huge investment, capital investment in, in whole energy, and whether it's base load, uh, stationary base load, power supply to mobile and to uh, uh, home, uh, and uh, business use of energy. And of course, the uh, uh, other challenges are very important, and the food, uh, we, we talked about food, and environment, and other issues. Of course, as scientists and engineers working in nanomaterials, we, th we think about how we can make a difference in terms of addressing the global challenges. In this case, it's energy. So we've been working in this area for uh, quite a long time, let me just talk about the global energy context. And you're all familiar, fossil fuel is still the predominant fuel uh, that is driving the, uh, been driving industrial 
industrialization for uh, uh, many centuries. And whilst the oil is approaching peak, but it's still not peaked, and uh, we know that the oil is still important, uh, transport fuel, but that doesn't mean that we should keep using oil. And we will have a lot of natural gas and a lot of coal. It doesn't mean that we will hang on to the fossil fuel because it's still you know, available. Therefore, uh, a lot of effort because of the climate change, also because it's good business to look at renewable, to develop renewable energy such as wind and solar and tidal and, and others. So this is driven by uh, business and driven by uh, uh, also commitment to address climate change. Many countries, uh, even developing countries, see that this is a great opportunity to uh, leapfrog in the energy infrastructure. Because once you build the energy infrastructure around fossil fuels, it takes a long time to really turn over and to convert to a renewable. How the nanomaterials come in, and nanomaterial is critical to uh, a lot of the energy systems and devices and processes, from energy generation conversion to um, utilization and, and transmission uh, in between. And storage is particularly important for renewable energy because uh, renewable energy such as solar and wind are intermittent. So therefore you need a good and, and effective technology to store the energy, whether you store the energy in terms of electricity, and that is batteries and supercapacitors, or you store in terms of chemical, and that could be hydrogen. You know, hydrogen is really interesting concept as an energy carrier, as a clean energy carrier in itself, it has to uh, come from somewhere. But the challenges for uh, energy materials is to look at what is the market needs in terms of cost, uh, in terms of efficiency or capacity. So let's just look at uh, six areas uh, related to mostly renewable energy and uh, the challenges in terms of materials. Photovoltaics has come down in, in price. The cost come down dramatically in the last decade, but still uh, three times higher than what it should be compared to the current thermal uh, power, electricity. So it needs to come down by a, a factor of three. And photocatalytic conversion of CO2 to methanol uh, it is uh, just one of those things that you can think about how to utilize the CO2 and to really recycle carbon and therefore reduce the overall uh, climate, um, uh, the greenhouse impact. Direct photosynthesis, uh, photo conversion, uh, whether it's photocatalytic or uh, uh, photovoltaic and the electrolysis to generate hydrogen is the holy grail. So basically, if you can find a very efficient way to convert, to split water into hydrogen, I mean, that is uh, the holy grail for uh, renewable energy. Uh, fuel cell is more about the utilization of energy. So the fuel cell cost is, is quite high at the moment. And therefore, there's a lot of uh, research going on in terms of the catalyst, in terms of the system, the thermal management of fuel cell system to drive the whole uh, technology uh, uh, become a more efficient and more cost effective. Battery supercapacitors are very important for both stationary storage and uh, mobile uh, devices because we rely on batteries to supply, um, to store energy. And for stationary, uh, as well as for uh, uh, transport vehicles, this is quite important to look at this kind of requirement. Uh, this is the DOE requirement. Still, apart from Tesla and, and, and other uh, companies actually trying to manufacture for uh, electrical vehicles, the uh, battery systems that can go uh, as far as, I think it's 500 kilometers, 
there's still a long way to go in terms of the capacity. Because hydrogen storage is a, a, a bottleneck in uh, the hydrogen economy. The whole infrastructure depends on the hydrogen storage. You need reliable, lightweight, reversible uh, storage system that is safe. This is where uh, solar energy uh, is important. In terms of solar energy, ultimately, is the clean energy in the sky, and it's a nuclear reactor. And the question is that how you can you convert the solar uh, radiation, the energy from the solar radiation, convert that into useful uh, energy, such as electricity, or you store that uh, in some form or shape, whether it's electric storage, that's battery, or chemical forms. You know, these chemicals, ammonia is also quite an interesting chemical to store energy. And uh, I personally favor the, uh, the chemical energy storage because it's convenient for both stationary utilization and, and transportation utilization. Through a fuel cell power plant, you can utilize chemical uh, energy, convert to useful energy. Right, this is where uh, uh, those of you who are chemists and chemical engineers familiar with the concept of catalysis. This is where photocatalysis is a, a very important part of the solution. So photocatalysis is a phenomenon that happens when photon hits the surface of a semiconductor uh, particle, uh, typically wide band gap nanoparticle, that would generate the electron hole separation. And that gives the ability to do uh, interesting things such as you know, electricity generation, that's a solar cell, if you uh, scavenge the electrons. And you, if you utilize the, uh, if you prevent the bulk and surface recombination with the carriers, and you can utilize the hole as oxidizing, um, you know, it has a high oxidizing power, you can uh, perform chemical reactions. And that has many applications, such as pollutant degradation. So the redox reaction is generated by this. It's all started by Honda uh, and his student Fujishima, Professor Fujishima, about 46 years ago, when they first published their paper. And this is a versioning field and many, many um, uh, groups and many researchers and industry actually doing for the catalytic. Uh, um, so I think this, re sorry, going forward, now I'm going back. But the question is that what is the best catalyst? Um, now what is the, uh, the optimal structure for catalyst that deliver uh, the efficiency or the reactivity that you want? So if you look at the properties of a uh, semiconductor nanoparticle uh, that will give you uh, very good absorption uh, or catalytic uh, reaction, you look at the electronic structure, you look at the crystal structure, and you look at the surface structure, how the atoms organize themselves on the surface, which respectively determine these properties. So from electronic structure, the absorption is very important, the band gap tuning, and the uh, crystal structure mostly determine the transport and the recombination of the carriers and the surface structure to do with the reactive sites. So ideally, you need to develop a for in general, of course, for specific applications, there are nuances. So a large surface area, a large uh, sort of a light absorption and suitable um, band gap for particular application and good stability and low cost. And that's the wonder uh, kind of uh, catalyst. And we have been doing uh, engineering. Uh, so a lot of uh, uh, work we do is to engineer the nanocrystalline nano for the catalyst to uh, derive uh, the perfect catalyst, not the perfect catalyst, a better catalyst. Uh, for particular application, for, for example, solar cells, diasensitized solar cells, or uh, water um, organic uh, uh, purification, and also uh, for uh, solar fuel conversion. So for different applications, you need, need the different uh, photocatalysts, and therefore the tuning or the design of the properties, um, you resort to different techniques. For example, this is just a summary. 
So doping, for example, can change the surface uh, structure. Ultimately, it will determine the surface redox reactivity. The surface redox side will be determined by doping, you know, different elements, inorganic elements, sulfur, nitrogen, whatever, on titania, on, on, on other uh, oxide nanoparticles. Or you can do a heterostructuring, two different metals or metal oxides put together that eventually will determine the interfacial properties as, and ultimately would uh, be able to uh, control the interfacial atomic structure and the, uh, the carrier transfer properties. And of course, the bulk, the crystal structure and the crystal phase and crystallinity would determine the surface state. And these are the things that we did, and a lot of work. And uh, one of the examples is to uh, engineer the surface by a crystal engineering technique. And this is a very simple hydrothermal, uh, but with a lot of uh, theoretical calculation, you, you find out, OK, for titania, it does exist in different phases. OK, so titania annotates crystals. Typically, you can synthesize by hydrolysis or flame uh, temperature flame reaction to synthesize titanium very easily uh, from the salt of titanium. And uh, you can achieve uh, basically 95% of the stable phase, which is the 101 facet in the crystallography uh, terms. And the 001 facet is the most reactive because it's unsaturated five and six uh, coordinate titanium oxygen bridges. So therefore, we designed this, and uh, uh, I'll, I'll show you the next slides. We achieved uh, the first work we did, published uh, in, in about 10 years ago, achieved 47%. Later, there are a lot of improvement. We can get to 84, 85% of 001, highly reactive facet, but a stable face. And it has a lot of applications. It all started from the inspiration from Michael Grizzle's work. It's a theoretical work. Uh, Annabelle Saloni and I was in Princeton. And they did this work, published in 1998, to say that, well, in annotated crystals, you have two dominant faces. And one is actually highly energetic. And this is the most stable 101 face. And this is uh, the, uh, the top one, truncated here is the zero to one phase. Zero to one phase has a high energy. And how to reverse the stability? Because high energy is not stable. And therefore, uh, we have to think about you know, how you can use capping agents or adsorbate to really uh, reverse the stability. So we did a lot of quantum mechanic calculation. So this is unrelaxed. Uh, so zero zero one phase is sort of a half and a half five and six coordinate, and this is all five coordinated. That's a one-on-one phase. And this is the adsorbate. And the adsorbate could be hydrogen, boron, and carbon, nitrogen, sulfur, and so on. So the quantum mechanic calculation, ab initio uh, simulation, tell us the lowest energy actually can be achieved when you put uh, the X as uh, fluoride as X. The fluoride atom actually you know, lower the energy in such a way that it stabilizes this, and therefore the preferential growth happens. And this is something and, and really uh, did. And you can see that um, that's 84%. But the later there was a Jax paper, another Jax paper, 2010, and we achieved nano crystal. This is a micro crystals, single crystalline, and with predominantly the uh, 001 facet. Uh, the uh, the isocellus the isocellus um, uh, uh, trapdial face, which is eight faces, which is these, uh, the size eight size, uh, sort of forty uh, percent or thirty thirty six percent. Now you can see that the uh, the reactivity probe testing in terms of the chemical photochemical reactivity is quite clearly demonstrating. And P25, which is a gold standard you use in the labs, and the fluoride uh, uh, adsorbed and the clean single crystal 
um, titanium, you can see the difference in terms of the reactivity. And then we try to apply this to uh, sen uh, dye sensitized solar cell, which is a micro Grazo's invention. And it's basically it's a photoelectrochemical cell, very simple, it was electrolyte. You have the dye to sensitize, inject the electron into the conduction band, and the whole uh, 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 cell can give you about 11%, which is much lower than solid state silicon based photovoltaics. But this is a very simple to make, it doesn't need a clean room, and it's very cheap to make. And now there's, there's many companies trying to commercialize this. Uh, in Australia, there's a dye, uh, I think uh, this still exists, there's a Daiso Limited based in Canberra. They commercialized uh, this first. And in Japan, there's many companies commercialized this. The efficiency is going up, but uh, this work we did is to try to demonstrate the light scattering, uh, how to enhance the light scattering and therefore uh, the light harvest efficiency uh, and then conversion efficiency by using the fluoride directed a single crystal but a hollow sphere to make a multi layer uh, photoelectrode. So basically, the mechanism is that to, you, if you have hollow spheres, you trap a lot of lights, a lot of multiple deflect, uh, scattering of light, and therefore uh, would enhance the. Uh, the idea is to enhance the um, uh, light uh, utilization. And uh, this uh, simply demonstrates a one pot synthesis using sugar as a template, and then you put these nanocrystals and to form a hollow sphere in one pot synthesis, and you make a double layer. This is only a double layer compared to the single layer. You can see that there's a uh, noticeable uh, improvement in the uh, efficiency. We also did uh, to try uh, just to demonstrate, just control everything else uh, being equal to demonstrate the facets reactivity uh, in terms of the dye sensitized solar cell. You can control the percentage of the 001 phase from 10% to 38% to 80%. Three samples, simple. And then you make the uh, uh, photoelectrode and test that. And my students did this, and uh, you can see there's a, a clear trend that uh, you know when you have more, this is 80 percent, 001 uh, facet dominated uh, crystals, and you make this electrode, and it's more efficient. Right. Um, we also did a lot of work on carbon, uh, mesoprost carbon, as energy storage. For example, in uh, lithium sulfur. Uh, batteries, and also supercapacitors. I just want to give you one example, and then I'll end the talk by saying something about uh, how you're going to really take this kind of materials to uh, devices and to, 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 to the market. Um, the the multi-shell um, mesoprous carbon, in this case, was derived by uh, my former postdoc, Jen Liu, who's now a professor at Surrey. And, uh, he did a very clever uh, stopper method to uh, turn RF resin into carbon and into a very controllable uh, mesoporous carbon uh, and spherical carbon. And you can see the characterization. Uh, so he did control the pore size to be around 3.5 nanometers. In fact, in earlier work in lithium sulfur, we found that you know, any pores that it's larger than six nanometers. It's not effective because the, sulf the lithium sulfide, the polysulfide is dissolved in the electrolyte and it gets lost when the pore is too big. And uh, predominantly between one and, and the six, you have this confinement effect of the sulfur and therefore maintain the stability. And we all know lithium sulfur battery gives extraordinarily high capacity and this recyclability is enhanced by the stability. So this work is demonstrate that. And this, uh, the Ragon plot here, you can see, oh, no, this is the uh, typical uh, cyclical test of uh, supercapacitor. Here you can see, uh, no, sorry, there's a lithium sulfur battery mixed up with the other work. So this is quite significant, even at uh, 
you know, 20 uh, cycles, you can maintain 420. Um, that's quite, quite a high capacity for lithium and sulfur batteries. Right, but the question is that, well, you can uh, develop many type of uh, wonderful materials, and how are you going to uh, make use of these materials? What's the route to market? So therefore, it's important to really look at the uh, context of the application of different uh, systems. For example, in the uh, energy storage area, we, we should look at you know, what are the requirements for energy storage. And this uh, uh, diagram shows clearly you, know, you have the uh, system power rating, you know, the, the power capacity, and the uh, discharge time from second to hours in this different system. And if you look at uh, the supercapacitors and the battery systems, they all fall into somewhere here. And of course, high power supercapacitors has you know, further potential to uh, be uh, built uh, or scaled up. So this is something that we need to put uh, into context. When we uh, have uh, wonderful nanomaterials for energy storage, you should look at this first and how we're going to really develop the strategy to take uh, from materials to devices to systems and then to the market. And of course, uh, this is also important to take the systemic, systemic, uh, uh, systematic approach um, and look at the uh, trans transport, the storage and conversion, all these dimensions. And then to develop a strategy to say, how are we going to create the system? And what are the questions you're going to ask? You know, who manufacture, who design, you know, who's the material, who are going to integrate, and what process you're going to use? And then to the value uh, capture. So how are you going to capture value? And it involves all these questions, you know, what's the price? You know, how to sell, and all these market questions. And then you're going to create a, a different kind of a business model. You're going to sell the materials in bulk, or you're going to sell devices, or you're going to sell the whole thing as a, as a, a service. So that requires the partnership with the businesses. And uh, yet, you need to realize that everything requires multiple iterations. And therefore, this kind of uh, property and performance relationship in material science generally applies to functional materials as well. So you need to uh, you know, informed by the market needs and trying to develop the systems, the performance uh, relationship, and the cost is one. And then go down a next level of iteration, that's to look at the properties. Now, how you design and use a simulation as a, as a tool as well to really optimize this loop. Eventually, you want to take it to the market. So basically, all the market is informed by the mega trends, the global trends, you know, global challenges and all these things. Eventually, uh, you want to drive high impact. And through the business um, models, uh, the whole ecosystem to take materials uh, to market requires uh, collaboration and open innovation. And this is uh, my concept of open innovation, which is uh, happening more and more. As I said, our 5G innovation center is an open innovation platform. It works very well. And material science, uh, particularly for materials, you know, there are so many potential, right? So this is interesting, that is interesting. How are we going to really take to the market requires this kind of thinking. You have ideas on materials and go through this funnel and then you try to use a lot of external collaboration and give you more opportunity for diverse exploitation of your materials. And that is, in essence, requires collaboration. This is my last slide. So collaboration uh, doesn't happen uh, spontaneously. Collaboration requires a lot of understanding of people, a lot of understanding of uh, the needs of different stakeholders, and therefore, the common purpose 
a very transparent way of communicating a relationship and uh, effective communication, effective review of the milestones, the goals, and how you work, and uh, wh whether you, know, you have better ways to work and to keep improving the relationship will lead to a successful collaboration. And uh, on that note, I'd just like to acknowledge my uh, uh, former colleagues who uh, in the energy area, these colleagues uh, who helped a lot uh, in, in various projects and the Australian Research Council and uh, also in terms of the bio clay work uh, from the Gates Foundation to uh, uh, Australian Research Council, the National Health and Medical Research Council and the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Um, so I'd like to thank you very much for your attention and we're happy to answer any questions. Thank you. The mechanism. To, to, to provide adhesion. Well, the nanoparticle, uh, the LDH nanoparticle, has a natural high affinity with the surface. Um, I mean, that's, uh, that's uh, you know, it's not by design, it's by coincidence. So, uh, but if not, if you use, uh, let's say, the CNC nanoparticle that you, you do, nanofiber you do, you can tune the surface chemistry to be more, uh, to have a higher affinity. So that's not difficult for, for chemists. You can just you know, functionalize it. But in this case, it doesn't need any additional functionalization. Just stay, stay quiet. I, I think because of the nanoparticle is small, it penetrates not completely to the cell wall uh, because uh, plant cell wall is very thick. It doesn't transfect you know, completely because you can see some actually get inside. Some is still on the surface. So there's no uh, particular strategy. Yes. How far are we from uh, uh, developing nano robots that go in the human body to cure disease? Well, um, there are many, uh, I think, uh, FDA-approved uh, uh, drugs that has nanoparticles as carriers for, for several cancers already, chemotherapy. Um, but when you say to cure diseases, that's a very general ambition because uh, for different applications, uh, you use different carriers. A lot of polymeric nanoparticles being used for drug delivery. Uh, I think a lot of people here would be familiar with that. And um, for um, uh, inorganic nanoparticles or quantum dots, it has uh, uh, additional... Uh, sort of advantage for drug delivery. And you can also uh, introduce the uh, photoemulsant and as a, as a sort of guided um, uh, um, uh, diagnostic and therapeutic uh, drug delivery. But uh, the wonder sort of uh, a silver uh, blue bullet doesn't exist. I mean, a lot of science fiction, but one day it will happen. You have this nanoparticle, it's multifunctional. You go into the body and you look for trouble look for, for the diseases uh, cells or, uh, and that actually then uh, locally diagnose and treat. And that's the dream uh, really for nanobiotechnology. And the, the real dream is uh, beyond uh, say probably 2030 um, is the self-assembled uh, biomolecules which is completely biocompatible and non-toxic. Uh, assemble into this sort of uh, uh, silver bullets. So it's probably uh, 10, 20 years away for that. But for, for a specific application, there are a lot of products on the market already. <laughs> okay. Can we use, uh, I'm not familiar, can we use uh, nanotechnology to, to purify salty water and make it drinkable? Um, well, there are technologies, and desalination you're talking about, and uh, there are, a lot of technologies, you know, uh, membrane is one. Of course, uh, uh, the photocatalytic reactions can also clean up water, uh, not, not desalination.
but there are many different uh, technologies being developed for uh, desalination, right? So uh, it's a matter of a cost. At the moment, it's still quite expensive, and there's a lot to do with the energy cost. Any questions? Well, we'll get a chance uh, during the networking at the reception at the back and uh, I think it was a fascinating talk from bioplane to global challenges and energy and water and what struck me suddenly that when I looked at the list by Smalley I saw democracies in ninth. maybe now because of Brexit and what happened globally it should be in the top the challenge yeah, that democracy is in trouble <laughs> we are facing today in democratic challenges as mm. well so Thank you so much. And, uh, thank, thank you. We have thank a you. Yeah. Small token of appreciation oh. with your talk and uh, oh, wow. also some gifts. Oh, as well. thank, thank you very thank much. You. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, great. Thank you. Thanks.